This first game we're going to look at, I played against a master named Katina. It was in Bermuda, which is one of the most beautiful places to play chess in the world, in my opinion. Um, there are tournaments held there once a year in the Mermaid Beach Hotel. It's an absolutely beautiful place, and you play the games with the with the sound of the waves smashing against the beach in this lovely, lovely setting. And um, this was played in the Open Tournament, which comes after the Invitational, which is all Grandmasters. Um, this was the fourth round I was playing against a master, rated about 2,200. I was rated around 2,500 at the time, so I was the clear favorite. The opening was the Sicilian defense. I was black. Okay, e4, c5, the Sicilian defense. The basic idea of the Sicilian is it's a counterattacking op- opening. He um, will generally play knight f3, I play d6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4. And this is the general structure that the Sicilian begins, begins from. Knight f6, knight c3, and here there are many different openings that black can play within the Sicilian but generally, if you notice, that white has control of the center. Um, he has a pawn on e4, which is further advanced than any of the black pawns, and he has two pieces in the center. Black will generally hold back, develop pieces, maintain, he maintains great flexibility, and will counterattack later on. It's a position of attack and counterattack. The open Sicilian is when they play knight f3, no matter what black does, e6, d6, however black chooses to play it, and then d4. c takes d4, knight takes d4. This is the open Sicilian. The trade of the, the white d-pawn with the black c-pawn is what defines the open Sicilian. The closed Sicilian is if, if white maintains the closed central structure. He usually puts the pawn on d3, and development will go with, within the closed structure. My opponent played b3, which is a strange way of handling the opening. His idea is that bishop b2, and he wants to take advantage of the a1, h8 diagonal. The way that black usually plays against people who don't play the open Sicilian is by developing the bishop on the g7 square with g6 and bishop g7. If they play, for instance, knight c3, g3, bishop g2, this plan, I would tend to play with g6, bishop g7, and take advantage of this diagonal later on. He decided to play the closed Sicilian, but with the bishop on b2. His idea being, I can't develop my bishop on g7, because if I play g6, I play bishop b2, and now immediately I'm, I'm weakened. Knight f6 is, now, is of course silly, because he plays e5, and I'm in big trouble. So immediately I'd fall into problems. So that's the, the idea of his opening. Play the close Sicilian and control the a1, h8 diagonal. I play e6. Now, I'm playing, according to basic principles, I'm taking control of the center. I believe this is a good way to respond to unorthodox openings because a lot of these guys, their idea is more to throw you off with the obscure nature of their line than it is to refute you, refute your game with impressive chess ideas. An idea like b3 is not as good as knight f3 and d4. But the idea of knight f3, huge, you know, world championship games have been played with the, with the open Sicilian. It's, it's a serious opening with tremendous, it's tremendously ripe. It is so much into it. b3, it's not really taking the advantage. If, if I play e6, I can, I'm, I'm taking control of the center. It's asking for an obscure line in which my opponent, by saying b3, is saying, I don't know chess theory very well, but I want to play a position which I'm familiar with and you're not so familiar with, even though it's not objectively the best move. Because to play the open Sicilian, you'd have to challenge me theoretically, which someone who's weaker may not want to do. And a lot of players enjoy playing strange openings, even if they're not necessarily good. And this is important to know. If your opponent plays a strange opening, don't necessarily assume it's just, oh no, I don't know, this is very good. You have to know your opponent is playing obscurely, not because it's so good, but because they're avoiding the main line. They're trying to put fear in you, but they're beginning with the first fear. And so if you have confidence that begins, that, that, that rises from their original decision to avoid. The reason they play this way is because they're avoiding. And you play classically, then you'll take, you'll take the, the first step. You'll be in control of the game. So, he plays b3, I play e6, bishop b2, d5. He plays e takes d5, e takes d5. He develops his knight on g1. It's time for us to develop the pieces. He plays knight f3, knight f6, bishop b5, check. A normal way to develop. He wants to simply check and then castle and try to take advantage of my king in the middle. After bishop b5 check, if I were to play bishop d7, he has a number of different options. It, first of all, it's a fine move to play. But what, what can potentially happen in this opening is we'll reach a structure of myself having an isolated pawn. If we trade off his light squared bishop and my light squared bishop, and he plays the move d4 later on, what's going to end up happening probably is we're going to trade my c-pawn for his d-pawn. And it's going to be a structure of isolated pawn. And the basic way to play against an isolated pawn is to trade it off pieces. You want to blockade the pawn and trade off pieces and use it as an end, an end game weakness. I'm playing with an isolated pawn. I want to maintain pieces and get an attack. 
So generally, what will happen in the isolated pawn positions is that white will try to take control of the d4 square with a knight, and will try to trade pieces along the e-file, controlling the critical squares. Black in turn will try to control the e4 square, put a bishop on g4 if he has one, and attack the king side. So if I were to, if I were to play bishop d7, I would be trading off in a position which will potentially become an isolated pawn position. So that's one reason why it may not be so good for me to do it. But it would be a fine move. In fact, objectively, I don't know which move is better. It's just this is a decision of taste. I wanted to play knight c6. Now, in terms of doubling pawns, for him to double these pawns is completely useless. Because the point is that I have control of the center right now. My D and C pawns are very strong. He's going to have to try to challenge my center eventually. If he plays bishop takes c6, b takes c6, which is, in fact, he did later in the game, the only two ways that he can challenge my center are with c4 and with d4. If he plays d4, I'm going to trade c for d and I won't have double pawns anymore. If he plays c4, when he plays c takes d5, I'll play c takes d5 and I won't have double pawns anymore. So the only way for him to challenge eventually my center is to relieve my doubled pawns. And also in this position, doubled pawns aren't necessarily such a big weakness. I can play c4 eventually with my rook on the b-file, try to take advantage of things that way. So it just, in fact, doubling pawns strengthens my central control. So double pawns aren't always a weakness. So bishop b5, knight c6, he castles. Now I have to make a decision which is not so hard. I have bishop b7 or bishop d6 to try to castle away. Bishop d6, rookie one check. My king gets stuck in the center and he's, he's exposed. My only way to block is bishop e6, knight g5, and I'm in a little bit of trouble already. I can't castle because I lose a pawn on e6, and I'm behind on time. So I play the sensible move, bishop e7, blocking the potential check. From here, what I want you to do is I want you to watch the game, noticing who forces things. And that is often a way to distinguish a stronger player from a weaker player. But the weaker player tends to always force things. And the stronger player tends to improve his position and work around that those those forced decisions. My opponent played d4, and you'll notice for the rest of the game, and in fact it began from bishop b5 check, he made all the changes in the position. I simply controlled the changes, improved my position, and took advantage of his mistakes. And this is what I said to him, in fact, after the game. I told him that he, the general theme of the mistake was to force, to push things. And this brings up the idea of maintaining the tension in chess, which is the the basis of, of, of high-level chess is maintaining tension of the position. Often there's sort of there's a, a dynamic stasis in the position, which is that whoever changes things drastically will be taking a disadvantage within that change. And so you have to improve within the, within the sort of strange dynamic equilibrium that exists. And in this position, he played d4. I could trade on d4, but then he would begin his, his central control, so I simply castled. Now he has the option of keeping on developing normally. He can play knight bd2. He can, he can even, if he wants to, try to play with c2, c4, but he started to force things. He played bishop takes c6. He instigated this trade. I played b takes c6. And now we can feel eventually what's going to happen in this game. White is going to try to take control of the dark squares. His, 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 the, the main theme of White's play is going to be to try to trade his d-pawn for my c-pawn and to trade off his dark square bishop for my dark square bishop and to try to occupy the d4 and c5 squares. My structure is very strong in the center. I control the e4 square. I have good potential attacking chances on the king side. But if he controls the c5 squares, then he has very good outposts for his pieces. If you take off if you take off the d4 and c5 pawns, and you take off the dark square bishops, and you take off, for instance, a pair of knights, if you look at this position, if imagine a white queen on d4 and a white knight on c5, and then the fight for the e5. What you'll notice is that black's bishop is the same color as his two central pawns, which is a big disadvantage. It's a bad bishop. White's knight on c5 can't be challenged. The queen on d4 can't be challenged because the e4 square is covered. This position is clearly better for, for white. And now, if black were to try to take control of the d4 square by trading queens, take the queens off the board. We're speaking abstractly, but we're looking at the nature of the position. Then black's plan would be to try to play b3 to b4 and try to control the d4 square with his knight. And then the c6 pawn is a big weakness. So by black's, white's plan is very interesting in the long term. Trading off of a superior endgame good knight against bad bishop because of my c pawns. My c and d pawns being located on light squares, and he can blockade them and have good outposts for, for his pieces. Unfortunately, given the concrete nature of the position, there's an element of this plan which is a little bit unrealistic because I'm going to attack. And you'll see in the game that he didn't have time to try, although he, cause, but he worked very hard at trying to control the dark squares. I was able to attack the king side, and suddenly the dark squares were completely meaningless. So. In this position, 
He took on c5, I took on c5, and he played the move knight e5. His idea, again, is to try to control the square, the, the, the dark squares. He wants to play knight e5 to d3 eventually. Kick my bishop off of c5, and also, and then begin his trade. He wants to play bishop b2 to a3. But also his idea is prophylactic. By playing knight f3 to e5, he's afraid of bishop to g4, which is an important pin. Then his knight will be pinned down, and I'll start the attack. So he plays knight e5, he's attacking my pawn on c6, stopping bishop g4. If you imagine if he didn't move and I played bishop on c8 to g4, he has to try to alleviate that pin somehow. If he moves his queen to some, to some strange square, I can take on f3, he plays g takes f3. If he plays queen to d3, then I'm just going to continue attacking. I'll play to rook e8, I'll play knight e4, and I'll, use the, I'll, I'll simply use the development. If he tries to alleviate the pin by playing h3, then I move my bishop back to h5, the pin t still exists. And if he plays g2, g4, what he's doing is he's creating a very unhealthy space between his king and defensive pawns. His king is, is feeling a lot of air between him and the pawns, and that's a big weakness. And you'll know, and this is in fact is what happened in the game, and I was able to slip between his defenses and the king. You'll see that later on. It's a double, the idea of playing h3 and g4 to alleviate a pin is a double-edged idea. I do it often myself. It can be very good and it can be very bad. It depends on the situation. And you have to be very delicate when handling that situation. Um, often it's very useful because you can actually win a bishop for knight in that, in that position. And often the other guy will allow you to do that in, t in, in exchange for the weakened pawn. So it's unbalanced and it depends on the position. In this particular example, the, my kingside pressure is so strong, is potentially so strong that to weaken his kingside can turn out really badly for him, a as we'll see later on. If he were to play the move h3 as a prophylactic move, it reaches a, a, a key moment, which the theme of this game, which, which we'll see later on, and of the next game also, is the idea of the pinned defender. So by playing h3, what you're trying to do is you're trying to stop me from playing bishop g4. What you'll also notice is that by playing h3, you've weakened terribly a square in the middle of your kingside structure, which is the g3 square. Because once again, the pawn on f2 doesn't really exist for the defense. So if you play h3, and I play a move like knight e4, for instance, or queen d6, then what I'm threatening is, if say you play h3 to stop bishop g4 and I play queen d6, I immediately have a threat if bishop takes h3, or a potential threat, because the g3 square is weakened. So h3 is a possible move, yes, but, but to do that move, I think probably the best move after h2 would be for black to play knight e4. And now you have to deal with the situation. By playing h3, you've weakened the g3 square terribly. It's a, good, it's a good possibility, but it provides a new weakness. And a lot of the time in chess, when you're defending one weakness, you suddenly expose a new one. Do you want to take the space your opponent just gave you? He played h3, but now I have g3. He played knight e5, attacking a pawn. Notice again, remember the, remember the theme in this game of him forcing everything. He attacked a pawn, I played queen d6, defended the pawn. Now I developed the piece, he played knight d2. Which is a normal move. He has to take control of the. He wants to try to develop a last piece to take control of the center. I played rook e8. Now my threat is rook takes e5, bishop takes e5, queen takes e5. He defends it with knight df3. Now he could also defend it with rook e1, but that would make that would defend something. But again, it would give up the defense of something else. The f2 f2 square would become weak. You have to always notice this when you have a good attacking position. Think of of what your opponent is leaving. When he plays a move, he's giving you something a lot of the time, because to defend one weakness, you expose another one. I played rookie 8, he played knight df3, and here I played the move knight e4, which is a very, um, a very good move, because the knight is very strong on e4. The other thing that can attack the piece, and the f2 pawn is weak. I have the potential attack on the f2 square. Also, I'm thinking about shuttling my queen over to h6, which is a good attacking square, and then I can play bishop on c5 if I want to, back to d6, and everything is aimed for the h2 square. Things are looking like they could become bad for him pretty quickly. He played the move knight d3, attacking my bishop on c5. Clearly, we know that his idea is to trade off my dark squared bishop and take control of the, of the dark squares. If I were to allow him to trade knight for bishop, it would be even worse. Because then, if he has a dark squared bishop, then I could be in big trouble. Because, his dark, because, because the dark squares in my game are very weak. I need my bishop to stop that. He played knight d3, I played bishop back to b6. And now he played a move which I think is absolutely horrible. He played b4, which is completely abstract, which is wishful thinking, and which has the idea of, of again, occupying the dark squares. He's very concerned with the d4 and c5 squares. But I don't... The thing about it is that when your opponent makes a move, the first thing you ask is, what is my opponent's plan? And then you ask, 
if it's a good one or not. You have to trust yourself because you're all you got in chess. His point is to take control of the dark squares, c5 and d4, but I realized that I didn't really care about that plan. I found that to be a useless plan because I, it was too, his plan was too abstract for the position because I was attacking. But also my move stopped his plan. I played bishop g4. And now once again he followed his inclination of forcing things. He played h3, attacking my bishop. I played bishop h5. And now he was so irritated about the pin, the pin on the h5, d1 diagonal, that he played the move g2 to g4, which is a, a terrible move, but in fact his position is already very bad. And now you should take a moment and think about the best move for black. I have a number of threats. One thing I can potentially do is I can play knight on e4 to g5 to attack the pinned piece on f3. If he takes on g5, his queen will hang, so I'm threatening to bust up his kingside structure terribly. Also, after h3, I'm threatening knight e4 to g3 later on if I want to. It's not so much a threat as a potential idea, because now he can't take it because my bishop on b6 pawn pins the f2 pawn. Another idea which I can play if I want to is my queen on d6 can come to g3, which is a tr strange looking move, but he can't take it. And now I'm threatening to mess him up here and there. He has big problems in this position. The only way he could figure out to deal with the pin is by playing g2 to g4. It might be tempting to move your bishop out of the way and then try to just take advantage of his weakness slowly by playing h7 to h5 or something like that. But in fact, what I played was very strong. Queen g3 check. And now he's completely lost. By playing g2, g4, he put air between his king and his pawns in front of them. And what was it, I was able to do is immediately, without hesitation, come in between that space. Always be very careful about your king's safety. You have to always protect your king. Pawns are the key, are the key defensive pieces around the king. And to push your pawns around your king usually creates a weakness. The best defensive structure for a king are the pawns on h2, g2, and f2. If you have a fee and shadow position with pawns on h2, g3, and f2, and a bishop, say, on g2, that's also very solid. But that has potential weaknesses, because if the, your light square bishops are traded off, you'll have a problem. A very important way to attack is to see the weakness in your opponent's structure and take advantage of it. In this position, his weakness was the g3 square and the diagonal on the d1h5, and he couldn't, take he couldn't defend both of those weaknesses. By, by living with one, the h5, d1, he would be in big trouble. He tried to stop that diagonal, and he allowed me to come into the other one. Queen g3 check. He played king h1, which is the only move, because again, the pawn on f2 is non-existent because my bishop on b6. I played queen h 3 check, and now he played knight h2, blocking the check. And now you should take a moment and think about the best way to continue the attack. You're up a pawn, but winning a one game is maybe the hardest thing to do in chess. You have to be accurate when you're winning. And often what happens to players um, at all levels is that when they have a winning position, they get overconfident and they, they lose objectivity. And if you lose objectivity in a winning position, then you're a fool. Because all that can happen is your position will fall apart. And it's also important to understand that when you have a winning position, it's when your opponent is looking for his chances the most. Because they're afraid. It's like an animal who's being hunted. And so when you're, when you're attacking, when your opponent is defending, if you miss something, if you relax, and your opponent is the most fierce, then you're in big trouble. You have to maintain the same ferocity as if you were losing when you're winning. So in this position, you have to be the most accurate. He, I played queen h3, he played knight h2. And now the best thing to do when you have, your opponent has a, has a pinned piece is to attack it. So knight on h2 is pinned. I played bishop b6 to c7, attacking the knight. And once again, we're going to feel that he's going to weaken a square to defend another, another threat. He pl the only way for him to guard the h2 square is to play f2 to f4. By playing that, though, he weakens the g3 square. So I slide my knight from e4 and knight g3 check. Only move is king g1. And now we have to figure out once again how to continue the attack. Your initial inclination may easily be to take on f1, because, you know, win the exchange, bam, take material. But that would be wrong. If you take on f1, then he can simply take back with his queen and you're going to notice your attack has slowed down. You're up material, but you don't have much of an attack anymore. His queen has come into the defense. He's coming to G the g2 square. Your bishop on h5 is hanging. And things could slow down pretty quickly. If you play, instead of knight takes f1, rook to e2, which is also a very tempting idea, he can block along the f2 square. He has two possibilities if you play rook e2. You can play rook f2 or knight f2. And the, and the, the e2 square you've given up control of. And he's um, continuing his defense. But of course, the position is completely winning. If rookie two would be a very sensible way to continue the attack. 
I, I, what I played is, is more forcing than that. It's winning by force. I played knight e2 check. Now he has three options. If he plays queen takes e2, you simply take back the queen and rook takes e2, and it's ridiculous. If he plays king to f2, take a moment and find mate in one. Queen g3 check, right? So his only move is king h1. And now notice before, we had the same position with my knight on e4. And I couldn't take on g4 because I would, he would play queen takes g4. And then after taking the queen, his knight would become unpinned. Now what I've done is I've put my knight between his queen on d1 and the g4 square. I simply put bishop takes g4. Now my threat is knight g3 check, winning the queen on d1. He's in big time trouble. There's nothing much he can do. He played knight on, d, on d3 back to f2. Now, checkmate in one move, utilizing the same theme as we've done the whole game, the pinned piece. Bishop f3 mate. His knight on h2 can't take my bishop on f3 because it's pinned to the king. His knight on f2 can't take my pinning piece on h3 because he's in check. So in fact, all of his pieces are attacking my pieces, and all of my attacking pieces are attacked by his pieces. But he can't do anything because he's in check, and it's mate. 